I'm going to start us off with Dr. Melanie Joy, and her talk is going to be on vegan communication. Dr. Joy is a Harvard-educated psychologist, international speaker, and strategic vegan advocacy trainer and a relationship coach. She is the author of five books, including the award-winning Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows, as well as her new book, Powerarchy, which is on sale upstairs at the table for Beyond Carnism. Dr. Joy was a lecturer at the University of Massachusetts in Boston for 11 years, where she taught courses on privilege and oppression, feminist psychology, and animal rights. She has given talks and trainings in six continents in over 45 countries, and her work has been featured in major media outlets around the world. She is the eighth recipient of the Ahimsa Award, previously given to the Dalai Lama and Nelson Mandela. Yeah, it's a big deal. This was for her work on global nonviolence. Uh, Dr. Joy is also the founding president of the charitable organization Beyond Carnism, also upstairs, and co-director of the Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy and co-founder of ProVeg International. So you will get uh, a lot more about them this weekend also. So Dr. Melanie Joy, come on up. As always, such an incredible, incredible pleasure and honor to be here and um, just so inspiring to see every year I come back there are more people coming to this event, um, and there are just more and more vegans, more and more people joining this movement all around the world, and I am so incredibly inspired. So thank you for being here. Thank you for getting up and coming out this morning. I'm going to talk about vegan communication. I believe that this issue of vegan communication is one of the most, if not the most, important topics for our movement to be engaging with. Now, as the title of my presentation suggests, how we communicate can impact our movement in one of two ways. Our communication can help create a resilient movement. That's a movement that's healthy and strong, and that's a powerful force for animals. Or it can feed the problem of a movement that's cannibalizing itself. And I think you guys know what I mean, right? Now, a movement is resilient when its proponents relate, interact, in a way that increases their sense of security and connection. And since communication is the primary way that we relate to one another, how we communicate will either increase our sense of security and connection with each other and within the movement, or decrease the security and connection. In other words, our communication can be more or less healthy or toxic and harmful. Toxic communication, I'm defining as communication, any communication that violates integrity and harms dignity. And let me explain this. Integrity is the integration of our core moral values of compassion and justice and our practices. And dignity is our sense of inherent worth. It's our feeling of being worthy, fundamentally worthy beings on the planet. So we violate our integrity whenever we communicate in a way that doesn't reflect compassion and justice. Basically, whenever we communicate in a way that's not respectful. And we harm another's dignity when we communicate that they are somehow less than, when we shame them. Here are some examples of toxic communications. Somebody referring to a vegan influencer saying, pathetic narcissists desperately seeking attention, they're doing something millions of others do without the self-absorbed need to broadcast it. A vegan, these are all by vegans, a vegan posting about vegetarians, if they've learnt and opened their eyes to the meat, so then why stop there? I think they're idiots, they're T-H-E-R-E, -E, idiots, <laughs> and can only assume it's because taste. At least meat eaters aren't hypocrites, and on it goes. If you look at these examples, take a moment to think about how you feel reading these toxic comments. How do you feel? How does this affect your sense of security with the person making the comments and with the movement as a whole? How does this affect your sense of connection? How many of you here have actually witnessed toxic communication among vegans? Let me just see a show. Oh my God, okay. I mean, I knew it was a lot. How many of you have actually been a direct target of toxic communication? Okay, that's also, that's quite a bit. Um, I mean, 
I have also actually personally been a target of toxic communication, and I have heard countless, like painful stories of countless vegans who have been targeted, um, you know, some of whom have once, had once been brilliant organizers who were just crushed. Um, I fa have found personally that many vegans quit the movement not because they can't withstand the pressure of living in a dominant carnistic culture, but because of the profound sense of betrayal and demoralization they feel living with, in fear of being a target of toxic communication among vegans. So many vegans have this constant fear that they too will be shamed by other vegans. Can you guys relate to this? Shame is the Achilles heel of resilience. It's impossible to feel secure and connected with somebody if we fear that they're going to shame us. Now, shame is not the same as guilt. Guilt is how we feel about a behavior. We feel guilty when we think, I did something bad. Shame is how we feel about ourselves. We feel shame when we feel, I am bad. Shame is the feeling of being less than, of being less worthy than. And most of us struggle to feel good enough. Most of us carry around a lot of shame because we've been born into a deeply dysfunctional, completely screwed up culture that creates a lot of shame in us. But we hide our shame. We hide our shame from each other because we feel ashamed of feeling ashamed. We hide our shame from ourselves. And when we shame others to try to get them to do something positive, we are actually creating generally the opposite outcome. Shamed people are generally people who don't feel like they have the agency to take positive, proactive action on behalf of themselves or others. Shamed people tend to withdraw or attack in self-defense. And studies have shown that when people feel that their dignity is not being honored, that they're being shamed, they tend to be less rational, have less access to their rational um, faculties, and less connected to their empathy. Studies have also shown that shame is contagious. When we feel shame, we're more likely to try to offset our shame by putting somebody else down, by shaming others. And in fact, studies have shown that toxic communication in general is contagious. Research has shown that being exposed to just one incident of rude behavior, like reading an insulting email, can cause people to reproduce these negative behaviors throughout the day and beyond. And that for every hurtful interaction we have, it takes at least five positive ones to offset the harm to our mood and the drain to our energy. So just imagine the impact of toxic communication now, expressed not just one-to-one, -one, but by someone who's influencing hundreds of thousands or thousands of others on stage or online. And imagine the increase in that impact when the person is in a position of authority. Our toxic communication is creating an epidemic of suffering, and it is doing tremendous damage to vegans, to vegan organizations, and to the movement as a whole. Researchers have estimated, um, or have, have done an assessment of the costs to organizations where toxic behaviors, which are primarily toxic communications, are prevalent or are, exist in 15 or more percent of the organization. And here are some of the problems that are caused in a workplace where there is toxic communication. And on top of this, this impact goes beyond the direct victims to affect the indirect victims, which are onlookers and friends and family members who hear about the toxic interactions later in the day or afterwards. They can also experience the same problems, just like non-vegans who witness vegans communicating toxically can be impacted by this and get turned off, of course, to our movement. Studies have shown that just one person who engages in toxic behaviors in a group reduces the group's performance by 30 to 40 percent. And the financial costs alone of a toxic workplace of a staff of 1,000 is over $2 million. 
Now, my colleagues and I did uh, an analysis and estimated what the costs of toxic communication could be or would be to a vegan organization. And we can apply this to the vegan movement as a, as a whole as well. So in an organization of 100 people, if 15% of those people engage in toxic communication, that would add up to $200,000 in lost productivity. If we, we define a, an efficient vegan advocacy organization as one that um, where one dollar, every one dollar can spare one animal, what this translates to, these numbers translate to 20,000 animals killed in the organization of 100, 200,000 animals killed. And even if our estimates are 80% off, 80% too high, which they're not, I actually think they're too low, that's 20% too many animals for me to be comfortable with and probably for anybody in this room. So in imperfect, useful analogies, to think of farmed animals being in like a sinking ship and with vegans as their primary chance of hope, vegans personing a lifeboat, um, for the farmed animals is their primary sense of hope. Vegans who are already exhausted trying to deal with the tides of carnism, the pressures of the dominant animal culture we're living in. Every toxic communication is like shooting a hole in the bottom of the animal's lifeboat. One reason, I'm sorry, I don't want to traumatize you guys early in the morning, but... <laughs> So one reason toxic communication is so prevalent among vegans is because it's prevalent in the dominant culture. Vegans are people, and most people haven't learned the tools for relating and communicating healthfully. I am forever amazed at the fact that most of us have to learn complicated geometry that we'll probably never need to use, and we don't get a single lesson on how to relate to other human and non-human beings healthfully. And if you think about the problems of our world today, they are not problems caused by people who don't know how to do geometry. On top of this, as I said, we've been born into a deeply dysfunctional, non-relational society. We don't have the tools to relate. So all of us are kind of messed up in the head in some way. This is just the norm of the world we live in right now. It's not a surprise that there's so much psychological suffering and that sometimes we lash out and act unkind. It's not a surprise. I'm amazed we make it through the day. So when somebody acts narcissistically or selfishly, it shouldn't be shocking. It's important for us to, you know, to really appreciate what we have inherited. And getting back to what I was saying before, you know, with toxic communication is, is all around us. And one of the reasons that we engage so much is because we believe that the target of our communication when we're communicating toxically doesn't deserve to be treated with respect. That's why we do it. It's really important for us to recognize that every one of us is nothing more nor less than the hard wiring we've been born with and every experience we've ever had in our lives. I have no doubt that if I had been born into the brain and family of Ted Bundy, I would not have become the vegan advocate I am today. Really, to feel and advocate compassion is a privilege. So we would do well if we could relate to the world the way it is rather than the way we wish it were. Now, I know this is a challenge, particularly for vegans, because vegans are visionaries. We have a vision of the way the world could be, which often translates in our minds into the way the world should be. However, this is precisely the kind of thinking that feeds this toxic moral perfectionism, whereby we hold others and ourselves to impossible standards. You know, one unexamined or even selfish choice or statement makes someone bad, makes someone the enemy. And at this point in time, the ethos, the backdrop of the movement and even beyond, is such that we not only tolerate, but we celebrate this moral perfectionism and toxic communication. We rally around those who raise the battle cry of moral righteousness, believing that it's all right to abuse others as long as you're morally outraged. Now, of course, anger is sometimes healthy and appropriate, but how we relate to our anger matters. When we relate to our anger in a healthy way, we recognize it simply as a signpost, alerting us to the fact that we're experiencing or witnessing what we perceive as an injustice. When we relate to our anger in an unhealthy way, it has the charge of contempt. 
Contempt is a red flag that we've placed ourselves in a position of moral superiority and it says more about us than it does about the person who we're feeling it toward. And we can do better. The vegan movement was meant to be, is meant to be a counterpoint to those dominant attitudes and behaviors in the world that we want to change. I know we can do better. Now, on a meta level or an overarching letter level, of course, we need to address the roots of the problem. It's important to develop relational literacy, which is the understanding of and ability to practice healthy relating. To this end, there are plenty of resources out there. I have three of them that I've written uh, specifically to address this problem. Um, my book, Beyond Beliefs, which is for vegans, vegetarians, and meat eaters relating to one another. My new book, Powerarchy, which I'll be speaking on tomorrow at 3.45. And a book coming out called Getting Relationships Right in January that I have. All of these are designed to help people become aware of dysfunctional power dynamics and shift the way that we relate to them. On a more practical level, now whenever deciding or when deciding whether to communicate, ask yourself the questions, as Rumi suggested, is it true and is it kind? If the answer to either of these is no, it's probably best not to communicate. We also need to commit to creating a healthy process. Every communication has two parts. It has the content, which is what we're communicating about, and the process, which is how we're communicating. The process matters more. A healthy process reflects integrity and it honors dignity. Does not mean we don't hold people accountable and try to change problematic behaviors. We hold people accountable, however, we do so without perceiving or treating them as morally inferior. In a healthy process, the goal is mutual understanding. It's not to be right, which means making the other wrong. It's not to win, which means making the other lose. It's not enough that the content is about compassion. The process itself also needs to be compassionate. It's also important to protect your and others' boundaries. Hold people who communicate toxically accountable and don't be a bystander and enable them. Delete disrespectful comments, don't forward them. If you run conferences or meetings or an organization, don't give a platform to people who communicate toxically and avoid the temptation to read toxic commentary. Toxic commentary has an addictive pull to it, and like all addictions, it compels us to do the very thing that ends up harming us. Stay connected to your empathy as long as you feel safe enough to do so. Empathy is the antidote to contempt. It is difficult, if not impossible, to look down on someone if we are looking at the world through their eyes can help to pause before communicating and keeping a sticky note next to your computer to remember that there is a being on the other side of it. And of course, these principles apply to how we communicate about organizations which are made up of people, in this case, vegan people, who care very much about the world and animals just like you do, some of whom have sat across from me weeping openly, devastated, people in very high positions of power because of what they read others writing and saying about them. I've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating. Honor the dignity of others. Be extremely skeptical of anyone who argues that it is ever appropriate to communicate without compassion and respect. I don't know of a single study that suggests that this is the case. In fact, what I know is the evidence points to exactly the opposite. Practicing compassion is not weakness. It is strength. It is not passivity. It is true strength. And finally, remember our shared bond. We vegans carry a heavy burden. We have to live with the awareness that every day, every second, horrific suffering is happening. And no matter how hard we work, we will likely never live to see the end of it. And this collective knowing and caring, it's a sacred bond that we share. We need to honor that bond so our movement can be the safe and resilient and inspirational space we need it to be so we can keep doing the work we're doing for liberation. We will never be thanked by those who we're trying to save. So we need to know and show one another that our caring and our efforts matter. At the moment, we are the primary hope that the animals have. 
So I want to just wrap up with thanking you for helping me to stay inf inspired, for being my hope, for helping me to feel secure and connected in the moments that I haven't. I find my source of strength and inspiration from the people in this amazing movement. And I want to thank you for doing that and, um, and thank you for continuing to do the amazing work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you.